Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the York Civil War Roundtable. My name is Adam Bentz, and I'm the Assistant Director of Library and Archives at the History Center, which is hosting the event together with the Roundtable. Uh, before we begin with this evening's program, uh, we have a number of obligatory announcements. We have a great amount of upcoming programming, which I hope you will join us for over the next few weeks. So if you can bear with me, uh, I hope that some of these will be interesting to you. Uh, just one moment, I need to maximize my screen here. All right, there we go. And I'm hoping that you're here for the round table tonight. Obviously we'll be covering a good natured drudge, the untold story of Ned Spangler. And that'll be done with uh, by Bob Bowser, who's with us tonight. Uh, next Tuesday, April 27th, beginning at 11 o'clock in the morning, we will be having our 18th century cooking demonstration by Christine Cooper, who is our manager of public programs. This event will be mostly an in-person event. Uh, Christine will be moving out into the garden area uh, in the colonial complex where she'll be doing the cooking outside. Uh, however, she will also be doing a few Facebook live clips of the demonstration in case you'd like to join us that way. A week from tonight on April 28th at 7 p.m., we will be hosting our All Vets program. All Vets is returning to an in-person program at the History Center at the Historical Society Museum on Market Street. So uh, please feel free to register ahead of that uh, to participate in person, or you could register on Zoom. We will be live streaming it as well as holding an in-person event. And all vets will be welcoming Buck Buchanan, who is a Vietnam veteran and a Huey helicopter pilot to discuss his experiences in that war. On May 2nd, that is the Saturday after that event, uh, two, I'm sorry, Sunday, uh, Sunday after that, or two Sundays from now, if I'm reading the calendar correctly, uh, at 2.30 p.m., the History Center welcomes you to join the South Central Pennsylvania Genealogical Society, which will be having a tour of the Maryland and Pennsylvania Railroad Heritage Village, which is at Muddy Creek Forks. This will start promptly at 2.30 p.m., and you can expect it to be about a two hour tour in total uh, of the different things, the different activities that make that up. Registration is not required. However, please visit our website for additional details because the SCPGS is asking for you to let them know that you will be attending. All right, our uh, big event of the spring slash early summer season, I guess May 7th is definitely still spring, uh, is the Give Local York event. We were very lucky uh, last year for Give Local York, uh, despite, despite the recent unpleasantness uh, with, with, uh, with health, need, needless to be said. Uh, we did very well in 2020. Uh, thank you for all of your support during that event. We're hoping to make um, 2021, an even bigger success for the History Center and obviously other nonprofits that are participating. So please join us for a full day of free events and charitable giving. Some things I'd like to highlight tonight. One of the first things we're doing is free museum admission at our different sites. First of all, at the Historical Society Museum, we will be open from 10 until 7 p.m. that night on May 7th. And we will be very happy to present an original copy, I believe it's one of 48 original copies of Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. So for those of you that are Lincoln fans, and I have a feeling many of you are if you're attending tonight's talk, this would be a good opportunity to see an original document from, uh, from I believe 1863, uh, a printed copy of the Emancipation Proclamation. At the Agricultural and Industrial Museum, they will be open for free admission between 10 and 4 p.m. that day. And we will be having a STEAM activity and scavenger hunt for students. And then uh, right up Pershing from there at our colonial complex, 
They will be open uh, for tours between 11 and 3 p.m. And we will be happy to feature multiple living history demonstrations that day. And then we will also have a series of featured speakers beginning at 4 p.m. This will be a virtual online only rebroadcast of a talk called Ancestors I Met on My Genealogical Journey. This was done for us a few weeks ago by Nisi DeShields Moulton, who was one of our local uh, genealogists. And um, she did a great job of talking about her, her journey through her own family's history. At 6 p.m., we will be inviting our community historian, Ophelia Chambliss, to do a virtual sneak peek of her upcoming exhibit on African-American history in York County. And then shortly after that, at 7 p.m., um, our well-known speaker and uh, Civil War historian, Scott Mingus Sr., will be giving an in-person talk at the Historical Society Museum starting at 7 p.m., talking about guiding lights, the Underground Railroad Conductors in York County, Pennsylvania. And this is to, uh, this is in conjunction with his recently published book on the same subject. Like I said, he will be speaking in person and we encourage you to register for that event. However, we will also be streaming it online. Uh, last but not least, well, I'm not quite finished for the night here, but um, I couldn't, I couldn't leave this out. Uh, the following day on May 8th, that's actually our second Saturday lecture, uh, which will be in person at the Historical Society Museum and on Zoom. You can register for either. This will be a talk by our longtime member, longtime volunteer, and uh, local industrial historian, Steve Smith. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Steve and, and what he does on his uh, on his blog uh, discussing primarily business history and industrial history, he will be presenting innovations of the S. Morgan Smith Company. So please join us for that. Um, it seems like it's really, really far off, but it's not. Uh, second Saturday in May. There we go. All right, and let's talk about next month. So our next Civil War Roundtable meeting will be taking place, as usual, on the third Wednesday evening in May at 7 o'clock p.m., and we'll be welcoming Professor Bruce S. Allardyce, who teaches in South Holland, Illinois, uh, quite a distance from here. But thanks to the miracles of technology, we can invite people from quite a distance to, to, give, us, uh, to give us their, to present their research. Uh, so... Uh, Professor Allardyce will be presenting what should be an interesting topic, or at least uh, something a little bit different, baseball during the Civil War. Baseball is America's national pastime and has often brought people together in times of crisis. It's fitting that baseball grew out of the divided America of the 1860s. Despite the immense political and social gulf that separated North and South, both sides shared common interests, including baseball. Professor Allardyce won't be discussing battles or cannons. Instead, he'll be talking about a sport that occupied more of soldiers' time than the fighting did. The presentation will focus on 1860s gameplay, how soldiers played the game, how the war affected baseball, and some statistics on soldier play. Allardyce will debunk myths and legends and will also touch on Civil War era baseball in the Susquehanna Valley. So, uh, for any of you that are sports fans, again, I think there is a lot of overlap, probably. Um, this, is, uh, this should be a very interesting talk, and we're happy to have Professor Allardyce come and talk with us virtually. Again, uh, as I like to do here, I'd like to thank uh, the York Civil War Roundtable for its partnership with the History Center. Um, this has been a longstanding partnership, and um, I think we're all very happy with what we've been able to do over the last nearly 12 months since we started uh, since we started virtual programming with the roundtable. So I'd like to thank uh, Kathy Friel, program director, and uh, the two Scots, uh, Scott Mingus and Scott Rosenau, who are her assistant directors in putting together uh, unique programming. Um, it seems to be something different every month, uh, focusing on local themes and some some other national themes, but um, I think I think we've been 
fortunate and very successful in that. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker if PowerPoint will work with me here. There we go. Uh, tonight, we're welcoming Bob Bowser to talk with the round table. And Bob is a high school history teacher at Henry E. Lackey High School located in Charles County, Maryland. Bob holds a BS in education and an MA in history. His main areas of research are the American Civil War and the Lincoln assassination. For the last 13 years, Bob has been a tour guide at the Dr. Samuel A. Mudhouse Museum in, I looked this up, I hope this address is correct, in Waldorf, Maryland. He has been a member of the board of directors of the Samuel A. Mudd Society for the last five years and is currently serving as its acting president. Uh, one more thing before we start tonight, please, uh, we ask that you save your questions for the end. It helps, us, um, it helps us move through the programming and keep things moving a little bit smoother. You can feel free to submit your questions into the chat feature on Zoom, or if you prefer the Q&A, you can do it there as well. Uh, I will be monitoring those questions. And I also think we have quite a few people on Facebook who are watching us tonight. So I will be monitoring questions there as well. So um, without further ado, I am going to stop my share and turn things over to Bob. All right, thank you, Dr. Bentz. Let me go ahead and get everything ready to rock and roll here. There we go. And let me see, give me one second here. That's not what I wanted to do. Uh, let me see. There we go. Um, let me see. Trying to get it so that I can see me and you all at the same time. There we go. This should do it. Okay, looks good. All right, there we are. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, I did want to start with just a few thank yous. Um, first and foremost, I need to thank Randy Drace, who I know is somewhere out there in the virtual world, uh, because two years ago, Randy was the one who actually got me in contact with the York Civil War Roundtable uh, and started the process to get this talk put together. Um, obviously, I was, uh, I was slated to do this last year for the 155th anniversary, but this was obviously right at the beginning of the pandemic right about the time everything shut down and we had not become, uh, we had not become aware of the wonders of Zoom just yet. Um, but here we are now, so we are happy to be together in the 156th anniversary cycle of the Lincoln assassination. Um, and I could not be more honored to be speaking uh, to, to mainly a group of individuals from York, Pennsylvania. I know that, uh, that Ned holds a special place uh, in, in York history and in your hearts. Uh, and I know I have a lot of pressure on me tonight. So I decided to put the man himself over my shoulder to keep me in line the whole time um, and, and uh, you know, keep a, keep a watchful eye on me as I hopefully do him some justice in this program. So thank you, Randy. Thank you, uh, Kathy Friel, uh, Dr. Benz, um, you know, the York History Center and the York Civil War Roundtable for giving me this opportunity tonight. Uh, I'm really excited about it. And uh, I think you all will, uh, you'll enjoy the program. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and, and get started with a good natured drudge, the untold story of Edmund Ned Spangler. And I would be remiss if I didn't start the talk by talking about the significance of April 21st in the history of Ned's life. So 156 years ago right now, our, uh, our subject tonight was spending his last night as a man who was not considered a conspirator uh, in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. He was already under arrest in the old Capitol prison up in Washington, DC. He had been uh, as such for the past few days, uh, but the events of April 22nd, so tomorrow, 156 years ago, uh, will, will ultimately solidify him to be one of the eight that are put on trial for conspiring to kill the president of Abraham Lincoln uh, and aiding and abetting uh, the assassin John Wilkes Booth after the fact, but that's for a little bit later in the program here. Um, so, without any further ado, let's let's get into uh, let's get into Ned's life a little bit here. Um, so, I always like to start with with asking the question, "Who is Ned Spangler? Who was this guy?" Um, and I, I intentionally put the piece up there about Wikipedia, right? I am a history teacher, uh, like was pointed out at the beginning. Uh, and I always point out to my students, you know, Wikipedia is a nice place to start, but you should never put it in the finished product. 
And then I turn around and I put Wikipedia right there on the front screen in my finished product. And that was on purpose. And the reason why is why I wanted to kind of justify what we're doing tonight here um, by talking about Ned Spangler and really to justify my title, The Untold Story of Ned Spangler, because I'm sure you all are very well familiar with who he was and how he fits historically. But uh, what I noticed was that as I started to research Ned, Ned was always the sideshow to the big show, right? Ned was in the story, but just in little bits and pieces. Like he'd get his supporting actor award. And I wanted to make sure that Ned got the spotlight, that his entire story from beginning to end was told. And that's what we're gonna try to do in the next hour. So we have our work cut out ahead of us. And the reason why I started with Wikipedia was one of the biggest pet peeves that I have with, uh, with studying and reading about Ned. And it's his name. Okay, those of you who are, are familiar with the story know that, uh, that Ned's official given name was Edmund, E-D-M-A-N. However, you will very rarely see him called Edmund Spangler. You will see him called every other derivative of Ed, Edward, Edmund that is possible. And when you Google his name, what pops up on the Wikipedia search is what you see on the screen right in front of you. So we can't even get the guy's, uh, we can't even get the guy's name right. So that's where I wanted to start it. It is Edmund, his nickname was Ned. And um, I also wanted to kind of start off by looking at the way that Ned was viewed in his time and how we view Ned now so that you have a baseline to start with in case you're not that familiar with the story. And then at the end, we're going to see how far we've come. We're gonna see if we can't redefine what was said about Ned here on this opening slide. So here's what Ned's contemporaries had to say about him. They, they called him, quote, a middle-aged man with a large, unintelligent looking face, I'll let you be the judge, uh, evidently swollen by an intemperate use of ardent spirits, a low forehead, anxious looking gray eyes and brown hair. Another person remembered him by saying that they quote, did not know whether Spangler was a desperate man, but he is low and vulgar in conversation. He tells dirty stories, he is rough. I do not think he has the courage of some roughs, yet he is rough. And if he did not have work, he would probably be a loafer. Okay, these are not shining endorsements of Ned Spangler. Here's how the newspapers reported him when he was put on trial. One of them said, quote, the heavy purple hued face of Spangler affords no clue to his thoughts, if he thinks at all. Another one called him rough looking, the subject of frequent practical jokes. Yet another noted that he, quote, never had drawn a sober breath, Another remembered him as, quote, very seedy and probably the worst one of all just simply said, quote, Spangler is stupid. All right, so thing, things aren't looking so good here with, with poor Ned. I'm gonna try to fix that by the end, I promise. Now, not every account from, the contemporary, uh, from Ned's contemporaries was bad. Obviously, I pulled a good natured drudge as one of the more positive things that was said about him. Um, and also others, the, particularly the guards that watched over him in the darkest days of his life, noted him as, quote, the most loquacious and jovial of the prisoners. So even in a bad spot, it seems like Ned knew how to keep the spirits light. And that's a theme you're going to see as we move through tonight here. What do modern historians have to say about him? One of them remembered is, is quote, the hard drinking friend of Booth. Another called him the pathetic feature in the assassination. And another referred to him as, quote, the least well-known of the conspirators. I hope by the end of tonight, we change that for you guys. I'm positive that we will. You're going to know more about Ned than many of the others by the time we get finished up here with this evening. And obviously, we know Ned as one of the eight people that was ultimately put on trial with the events sur uh, surrounding the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And if we're being honest, and we should be honest, um, if we look at that cast of characters, Ned certainly was not the masculine pal who captivated the nation's attention, particularly the women folk with his photographs and the sketches put in the newspapers. He certainly was not the mysterious woman behind the veil who the whole nation wanted to know more about. And he definitely was not the genteel country doctor born into the upper echelon of Southern society who was forced to sit next to him on the prisoner dock. As a matter of fact, if you look at the accounts in the newspapers, Ned really kind of gets ignored completely, other than these very rousing descriptions that we had just read about him. So the question is, who is Ned Spangler? And what better place to start than where many of you are sitting tonight? 
Most of you out, uh, out there know that Ned is actually a, a native of York, Pennsylvania, where he was born and bred. Uh, and the quote that I pulled for this slide is actually right out of one of the statements that he gave later in his life. He was a very proud Yorker. He never forgot where he came from. Uh, and I, I think that's a tremendous tribute to the city of York. Um, let's start at the beginning. He was born on August 10th, 1825. He was the seventh of seven children. Uh, his parents were William and Anna Spangler. He was baptized in Trinity Reformed Church. So the family is, is you know, they're of German stock uh, and they are in the German Reformed Church. And one of the themes of Ned's life that we're going to see happens throughout the entire time we're here talking tonight is tragedy. And tragedy strikes Ned before he's even conscious enough to understand it. When Ned was just seven months old in February of 1826, his birth mother passed away suddenly. So Ned really never got to know the woman who gave birth to him. Now his father, William, is going to remarry and there will be a mother figure that Ned cherishes in his life growing up, but it's not his birth mother. And that kind of sets the tone of tragedy that's going to carry through our story tonight. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Ned's father uh, and, and the family here, because Ned comes from good York stock. Um, at one point, his father, William, was the county sheriff for three years. The family, the Spangler family, was described by one Yorker as, quote, one of our best families. And his father was remembered as very highly respected. Um, if we step back and take a look at Ned's genealogy, um, if we go all the way back, Ned's great grandfather was Johann Balzer Spangler who was one of the founders of York. He's a direct descendant. Um, he, one of his, or sorry, his grandfather, John, was very noted in the American Civil, or sorry, in the American Revolutionary War effort, being a member of the New York militia, as well as members of the court, uh, a member of the Committee of Correspondence and of Safety, and then later on went on to be one of the county commissioners. William, like we said, his father, is gonna be uh, the county sheriff. So Ned comes from a fairly storied line of Yorkers. Uh, one Yorker who knew Ned as a young man remembered that he was always considered honest, easy, and kind-hearted. So if we're trying to fill out that definition of who this man was, this is somebody who knew him as a child. Um, not really sure about Ned's education, but we do know that Ned had some education. He was literate. He was able to write. Um, sometimes his spelling and his grammar is a bit rough. He does spell some things uh, phonetically, uh, but he could he could read and write, and he does leave behind some accounts that we can use to understand his life. Um, and like everybody's, uh, like everybody, Ned's life was really shaped by the relationships that he made throughout uh, throughout his existence. Obviously, his earliest uh, his earliest relationships would be with his family, um, would be with his stepmother and his father, with his brothers and sisters, with his younger half sister. Um, and I think those relationships really built him uh, into the man that he would become, the, giving, him, giving him the character uh, that he ultimately would have as well. Um, and another relationship that I wanted to bring in to, through some of the research, I found that on the 1850 census, so Ned is a 25-year-old man, there is another individual living with the Spangler family, and his name is Theodore Jacobs. And doing a little research, I found that Theodore Jacobs was actually Ned's cousin on his father's side. And the thing that stuck out to me about Theodore Jacobs was that he was a carpenter. He's listed by trade as a carpenter. And those of you who know Ned's story know that that's what Ned is going to do to make a living. And so I think very early on, he's surrounded by these strong men, by Theodore, by his father, who also, uh, who also practices the trade. And they are going to kind of set Ned on the course of his career for life. And that carpentry trade is going to is going to mean more to Ned than just simply a means to make money and to put food on the table. I think you'll find as we go through the talk here. So we know that Ned obviously does not spend all of his days in York. Um, and one of the questions that popped into my mind as I was doing the research is why would he leave home? He's got family surrounding him. He's familiar there. He's well liked. Why leave home? Why strike out on your own? And there's a couple answers to that. One, when Ned does decide to leave around 1850, he's, a, he's in his mid-20s. And I don't know about you, but by the time I was in my early 20s, I was ready to go out and prove to the world that I could actually do something. I could contribute. And I think that's where Ned is mentally by the time we get to the point where he decides to leave York. But some further research uncovered another motive for why Ned left. And once again, it's that theme of tragedy in his life. 
Somewhere in 1846 or 1847, Ned's father, William, suffered some kind of accident that left him, in his own words, a, quote, poor cripple. Now, I did a little digging to try to see if I could figure out what happened, and I did find an account from another Yorker who stated that, quote, he was deprived of the use of both legs by falling from a building while at work carpentering. Right? So to me, I kind of took that that he was paralyzed from the waist down. However, later on, William is going to write a letter to Ned while he's sitting, uh, sitting in prison uh, and on trial. And in it, he's going to give us a little bit more insight that makes me think that he wasn't paralyzed, but it was still a severe injury. He asked Ned how he was doing and then followed with this quote, I am getting worse in my leg and my arm, and I can scarcely do any work. Now, why does all of this matter? Why did, why did I take time to go jumping down that rabbit hole to find out about Ned's father? It's this statement. In 1869, Ned's father was trying desperately to get Ned pardoned from prison. And he was writing to people to try to get them to write the president to petition for Ned's pardon. And in it, he was kind of talking about his life and, and what Ned meant to him. Here's what he said about Ned. He said, Edmund was our main support for many years. He paid our rent regularly and was an affectionate and dutiful son and saved what he could out of his hard earnings to comfort us in our declining years. He's talking about himself, William, and his second wife. And right around the time that accident happens is when Ned decides to leave York in search of that career that we just talked about. And he's not gonna have to go far because just 60 miles to the South is a city that in 1850 is on the rise. It is growing. Um, the city directory boasted that its undulating surface afforded much room for romantic and classical building. And it went on to say that nearly 2,000 buildings had been added in the last year alone. And to make matters even better, this city is on a direct rail line with York. And that city is Baltimore. And so somewhere around 1850, Ned's going to leave home and he is going to travel south about 60 miles to Baltimore in search of starting that career and making some money to send home to help his crippled father. And as luck would have it, maybe it's providence, maybe it's some kind of divine being, his job that he is going to land with is with a builder by the name of Alexander and J.J. Gifford Builders. That's the company he gets hired with. Now, those of you that know the story probably recognize that last name Gifford. That's because one of the two brothers who own it is going to be a character that we talk about throughout the rest of this story. His name is James Johnson Gifford. That's the JJ in the name. And to give you a little bit of background on Gifford, Gifford's about 10 years older than Ned at this point in life. He was described as, quote, a rather cross-grained man and except to intimate friends was exceedingly unsociable. Okay? I want you to remember that because we're gonna come back to Gifford a couple of times. I want you to see what he does for Ned and what that says about their relationship if this guy's hard to get along with. And one of the first jobs that Gifford is going to have Ned along with is to build a cottage in the northern, uh, the northern suburbs of the city of Baltimore to a, for a famous actor by the name of Junius Brutus Booth. That's right, the father of John Wilkes Booth. And the building that we're talking about is pictured here. It's Tudor Hall, If the, for those of you who know where it's at, or maybe some of you have even had a chance to visit it. Construction began in 1851. It's gonna take a few years for that, uh, for that building to be completed. And it's probably here at Tudor Hall where a 26-year-old Ned is going to meet a 13-year-old John Wilkes Booth for the first time. Now, I know a lot of you are probably wondering when I'm going to get to the Bland Academy, because that's part of York's history as well, and whether or not that was the first meeting place of, of Booth and Spangler. And unfortunately for me, I don't think that's where they met. A couple of reasons why. First, when Booth would have been at the Bland Academy, Ned was already down working on Tudor Hall. So the chances of them meeting uh, meeting at Tudor Halls kind of outweigh the chances of meeting at the Bland Academy. And secondly, when Ned writes later in life about meeting Booth, he, he references it right after this statement here. I worked for his father in building a cottage. So where he, whether he meets him in York or in, or in, in uh, Baltimore, I'm not sure. I tend to leave it, uh, lean towards Tudor Hall. 
But at this point, I don't think anybody is talking about assassinating presidents anyways, right? I don't think these two are, are sitting there conversing much uh, about anything. A um, couple of interesting little vignettes about this, this relationship, because this is going to set us on a trajectory that will come back in a few slides. Um, as the story goes, Junius Brutus Booth never actually lives to see the completion of the house. He dies unexpectedly out of town, out on the road, um, touring in 1862. And unfortunately for Gifford, Junius Brutus Booth had not squared up on his payments for Tudor Hall. And he did not tell his wife, Marianne, this. And a legal battle is going to ensue between the Gifford brothers and Marianne Booth. And ultimately, the court is going to side with Mrs. Booth. Um, Gifford notes that this caused him to literally lose his home. The business will break up. And um, allegedly, Gifford was so angry that he came back out to the site with a hammer and ripped the roof off to try to get even. But at any rate, it's going to turn out to be a good thing for Ned. Because after the business collapses, James Gifford is going to get hired by John T. Ford to help renovate and build theaters in the city of Baltimore. And this is where both Gifford and, uh, and Spangler are going to, to, come into, uh, come into the relationship that they will have with John Ford. So after the building of Tudor Hall, Ned decides to stay in Baltimore. He doesn't go home, right? There's work there. He's working with a crew that obviously, you know, if he can, if he can suffer through, uh, suffer through Gifford's sort of irascible personality, they must have liked him and they kept him on. So Ned is going to start to work in and around Baltimore in these theaters, um, doing rough carpentry and shifting scenes, um, and obviously still going out and and working on other builds throughout the city. Um, Baltimore is going to be a very special place for Ned Spangler for a lot of reasons. One, this is where he kind of gets his independence. It gives him the ability to send money home to help his family. And also, in the later part of the 1850s, about, you know, about eight or nine years after Ned moved in, he is going to meet and fall in love with a woman 10 years his senior by the name of Mary Brashears. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Mary to build out the story here, because many of you probably knew that Ned was, was married, but I wanted to do, uh, I wanted to build up the, the family that Ned would have been a part of. This is in addition to his family back in York. Uh, Mary was the daughter, the fourth of four children uh, of John and Mary Brashears. She grew up in Prince George's County, and as she reached adulthood, she followed her older siblings, all three of them moved up to Baltimore, Somewhere in there, she meets, Med, uh, she meets Ned, the two fall in love, and they will be married on August 29th, 1858. Uh, the 1860 census has the two living with another couple sharing a home, possibly to save money for, for you know, to send money back home to, to the family at 60 North Canal Street. Now, those of you who are a little bit more in depth and understanding with the, the story of Ned, you'll know that that address is just a few blocks away from the Booth townhouse that they still kept in the city, right, to try to add a little mystery and intrigue here. Um, and I don't know about you, but when I, when I look at the picture behind me here, and when I look at other images of Ned Spangler, for the longest time, I always felt that Ned was a loner, you know, that there wasn't really anybody out there in the world for him. However, in fact, in Baltimore, Ned is surrounded by a massive family. Like we said, he's got three in-law families that live in and around him. One brother-in-law was a shoemaker. One brother-in-law was a police officer for the city of Baltimore, and the other was a carriage maker. And they all live within a few blocks of each other. Between just his in-law family, there were 15 nieces and nephews. So Ned is an uncle to all of them. That's not counting the nieces and nephews that are back in York. And remember, the two cities are connected by rail. They can easily travel to and from. And then through some more research, I actually discovered a friend of Ned Spangler's. It was a man by the name of Charlie or Charles Brown. Yes, Ned Spangler was friends with Charlie Brown. To, to, to get away from here. Um, when I did a little research on Charles, he was very difficult to find much on. There's more that needs to be done there. However, what I did find was he was in fact a carpenter that lived just to the west of the theater district in Baltimore. And in 1864, he wrote to Ned um, from the city of Cincinnati. He had gone out there to just kind of explore and, and see life. 
and, and one of the things he said to Ned when he wrote, and he opened up his letter was, give my love to all the old inquiring friends and Maggie and Mary. And Mary is undoubtedly Ned's wife, Mary. I'm not sure who Maggie is yet. I've done some research and I'm gonna continue to dig to see if I can figure out who that is. Um, but it was just interesting for me to see a letter that was just written to friend Ned, not to the conspirator or anything like that. Um, John T. Ford tells us a little bit more about Ned's time in Baltimore uh, that might be helpful for us to understand a little bit towards Ned's political leanings. Um, the, the Spangler family was referred to in York as, quote, stalwart old Democrats. And John Ford actually adds a little bit more intrigue to that. He said in his testimony in the trial that in Baltimore, Ned was known to be a member of the American order. That would be the Knights of the American Order, a derivative of the Knights of the Golden Circle, if you're familiar with that. Now, I did a little research, and it seems like if Ned was actually a member of the Knights of the American Order, that he was a very low level member, and it was more for social purposes than for anything nefarious against the federal government. Uh, one thing that does stand out, though, that kind of leads me to believe that he could possibly have been a member um, was that in that letter from Charles Brown, um, he noted, Charles noted his disdain for Abraham Lincoln and his reelection, and he ended the letter with, uh, with this quote, old Abe, how are your 500,000 more conscripts, question mark. And one of the hallmarks of the Knights of the American Order was they despised the draft. They were against the draft. And I have tried and tried and tried to find where Ned registered for the draft. I've looked in both Baltimore and Washington and I cannot find where the man registered. He absolutely was eligible. He had to register for the draft according to the law and I can't find him anywhere. So maybe he's out there and I haven't stumbled across him yet or maybe he really was anti-Lincoln, uh, anti anti-draft. Who knows at this point? A um, Couple of things to note about Ned's time in Baltimore. Ned would have been in Baltimore as Abraham Lincoln sort of snuck through the city on his way to the inauguration those of you who are familiar with the Baltimore plot in 1861, where Lincoln was to be assassinated on his way to Washington, uh, and then the powers that be decided to take Lincoln on an earlier train through uh, the city of Baltimore in the middle of the night, really did not sit well with the people of Baltimore and the people of Maryland. Um, and then follow that up on the heels of the, or on, the on its heels, the, the Pratt Street riots, which, of which Ned lived about three blocks from Pratt Street, um, and the occupation of Baltimore thereafter, uh, and you can sort of see Ned's worldview from somebody living on the inside of Baltimore. However, life was looking up for Ned in Baltimore and a brand new opportunity was just around the corner. And that opportunity happened to be in another city, the city of Washington. The Ford brothers decided that they were going to expand operations into the city of Washington. And in 1861, John Ford purchased what was then the first Baptist church of Washington. Um, on 10th Street between E and F on the cross streets. And he wanted to convert it into a theater. And who does he send? None other than James Gifford to go and to build what would become Ford's Antheneum in Washington. So it's undoubtable that Ned went with, uh, with Gifford to help do some of the construction work, bouncing back and forth between Baltimore and, uh, and Washington. But unfortunately, Ford's Antheneum burned down in 1862, or it's a, a severe fire, a fire gutted it. And once again, Gifford is going to have to go and rebuild, taking Ned along with him. And at that point, Ned really becomes kind of stationed at what would be rechristened as Ford's Theater in Washington. Ned stays behind in Washington and, uh, and takes up the duties of a scene shifter once it opens in 1863. Um, John Ford noted that Ned considered Baltimore his home, and he usually spent the summer months there uh, when the theater was on vacation. Um, and he also mentioned that in Baltimore, Ned was widely known for his crabbing and fishing abilities, calling him a great fisher and crabber. So if we're trying to figure out who Ned is, maybe angler should be another adjective that we use to describe him. Um, to talk a little bit about Ned's life in Washington, it's very meager. He is listed as living at Mrs. Scott's boarding house on 7th and 8th Street. Uh, he, uh, he essentially has a room there with other uh, stagehands and scene shifters, um, but he does not live there by witness accounts. He goes there to take his meals. Uh, Ned preferred to actually sleep in the theater. 
He's being paid $15 a week. That is $245 if you, um, if you pay him all throughout the year. And to do some simple conversion over, that's only about $12,000 in today's money. So it's a wonder that Ned was able to send money home to help pay for his parents' rent. But think about what that says about Ned. He's making barely anything, yet he's finding money to send home to help his family and to be the one that's really kind of there to, to make sure that their house payments are made. Um, it seemed by all accounts that the, uh, that the staff at Ford's really liked Ned. Uh, they, liked to, uh, they liked to pull practical jokes on him, which he seemed to take in stride, kind of goes along with that spirit that we've talked about earlier. Um, and, but some uh, significant things are going to happen to Ned while he's living in Washington. Um, the first one is once again, tragedy is going to strike. On July 24th, 1864, Ned's beloved wife is going to pass away at her sister's home in Baltimore. I don't know if Ned was in town or if he was in Washington when she passed. He undoubtedly made it back for the funeral. Um, the obituary noted that she, that she died of, quote, a long and painful illness, which she bore with a Christian fortitude and resignation. And by all accounts, that is the moment when the drinking really starts to pick up. The witnesses, the people that knew Ned started to note that after Mary passed, he started to, to, to slide into alcoholism, something that we heard so much about in those accounts earlier. Right after Mary's death, another important significant event in Ned's life is going to occur in Washington. He is going to be reacquainted with a now very famous young actor by the name of John Wilkes Booth. In Ned's words, he said, during the winter of 1862 and 63, John Wilkes Booth played a star engagement at Ford's for two weeks. At that time, I saw him and conversed with him uh, quite frequently. After completing this engagement, he left Washington and I didn't see him again until the winters of 1864-65. I then saw him at various times in and about Ford's Theater. And it's at that time when Ned is gonna actually start to make some side money helping John Wilkes Booth. He is going to fix up a stable in the back alley behind Ford's Theater and Baptist Alley. He is going to start taking care of some horses that Booth has purchased in early 1865, as well as a buggy that he will purchase. Ultimately, he will be the one responsible for trying to sell those in uh, early April of 1865. And many people noted that Booth would wine and dine with Ned. He would take Ned right next door to Ford's to uh, Tataval's Star Saloon. And the two were frequently seen taking drinks in there. Now let's fast forward to that fate-filled night in 1865, April 14th, Good Friday. Um, we know that that is the night where Ned's life and the life of really every American then and since is going to change. Um, if we backtrack a little bit and take a look at what Ned's doing on Assassination Day, he's going around uh, trying to finish up uh, a lot of the jobs that have been assigned out to the staff at Ford's to try to celebrate Laura Keene's 1000th performance. There's a lot of edge that day at the theater and Ned is gonna be tasked with doing several things. One of the most notable is he is gonna be tasked with helping remove the partition from the president's box, right? So that places him in Lincoln's box just a few hours before the assassination takes place. That will come back, uh, that will come back to haunt Ned uh, a little bit later on. Uh, Ned noted that it was about five or six o'clock that Booth showed up to put his horse in the stable. Uh, Ned is going to help him do that and then go into the saloon and have a drink with Booth. Booth is then going to disappear and Ned notes that really the rest of his day was just spent with resting a little bit for the night's performance. He knew he had a key role in helping shove the scenes back and forth um, as well as uh, as well as you know, getting getting his dinner, resting a little bit, and being ready for the performance to start. Um, the performance starts at 8:15. You all know the story without the Lincolns, um, and it's around nine o'clock in the evening when Booth is going to show back up at the theater. And what Ned notices is that right in the middle of the play, he is informed by one of the actors that John Wilkes Booth is in the back alley and he's asking for Ned. So Ned leaves his post and walks to the back door and there stands John Wilkes Booth holding a little bay mare. And here's what he said about it. He said that Booth asked him to quote, hold this mare for 10 or 15 minutes in which Ned replied, I, I really can't, you know, I have not. 
but I would call Peanut John. He would call Peanut Vendor out to hold the horse for him. And Booth walked into the theater and we know what's going to transpire next. Ned is going to hand that horse's reins off to uh, John Peanut and he will return back to his place behind the wings as the play continues. And, and Booth is going to be kind of just hovering around in the wings. Now, what we know is going on is that Booth is waiting for that most per perfect moment in the play, that now famous line that's gonna be delivered by uh, Harry Hawk while he's on stage by himself, don't know the manners of good society, eh? Well, I guess I know enough to turn you inside out, old gal. You start dialogizing old man trap. And at that point, Booth has already entered the president's box. He squeezes the trigger on that Derringer and history is made. Uh, Ned is gonna note that he heard a shot fired and immediately saw a man run across the stage. Um, and it, just like everybody, Ned reports being completely stunned at what was going on. And then the crowd really starts to you know, cry, stop that man. And um, really all hell's gonna break loose in the theater at that point. Ned noted that he saw someone run out at the prompter side, that is the opposite side of the stage that Ned is gonna be on, uh, and exit the left-hand side of the stage, right? He's gonna go out, shoot out the door into Baptist Alley. Now, Ned is standing next to another stagehand, a guy by the name of Jacob Rittersbaugh. And Rittersbaugh reported that when he saw Booth run past and heard somebody yell, stop that man, he started to chase Booth, who was armed with his knife that he had just used on, on Major Rathbone. And as he's just about to catch him going out the back door, it slams in his face. He jumbles with the door. And by the time he gets it open, he cannot get to Booth, who is already in the saddle and going down Baptist Alley. Ned remains on stage. He said that as soon as this happened, people started jumping on the stage and that he started to shove the scenes off so that people could get onto stage to see what was the matter. And about that time, Rittersbach comes back and tells, tells Ned that was John Booth. And allegedly, according to Rittersbach, uh, Ned is going to open hand slap him in the mouth and say, shut up, you don't know anything about it. That's the quote that gets attributed to it. At that point, Ned decides that he's going outside to see what happened. He walked out the same door that Booth had just exited. By this point in time, it's probably setting in what has happened. Um, and Ned reports only being able to hear the clatter of hooves by the time he gets outside. Witnesses from across the street, a couple of African-Americans who lived right across the alley, um, called Ned over and said, hey, Mr. Ned, you know that man, Booth, he called to you and, and Ned didn't want to believe it. Ned said, no, 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 I don't know what you're talking about and, and sort of stunned, walked off into the mist of the evening. And he is going to disappear for a few hours and nobody knows exactly where it is that he goes. Later on that evening, in the middle of the night, in the middle of some rain, one of the actresses, a lady by the name of Janine Gourlay is going to hear a knock at her door. And when she opens her door, there stands Ned, dripping wet, holding a small dog. And Ned asks her if he can come in and spend the night. Now, her father, who was also a member of the, the uh, acting company, absolutely forbade it. He wanted nothing to do with anybody from the theater. And Ned is cast out into the rain once again. And so he is going to go, really, to the only place that is familiar to him. He's going to go back to the theater. However, he noted that he did not want to sleep in the theater that night because, quote, I was fearful the theater would be burned and I slept in a carpenter shop adjoining. So Ned essentially went home. The next day, Ned is going to be arrested with one of the other, uh, one of the other people at the theater. He, just like you know, pretty much everybody who was either working at Ford's or involved in the play, they are going to be picked up in the next few days and, and brought in for, uh, brought in for interviews. So on the night of the 15th, Ned's going to be arrested and he is going to go in and give a formal statement about, uh, about what he saw. Um, and he will spend the night in custody. However, he will be released the next morning. And as he's leaving, he asks, what is to be done with me? What are you going to do with me? He's nervous, right? You know, what's going on? All of the actors, all of the stagehands are very concerned about their future. And very snidely, um, that he is, he is told, we know where to find you, 
when you're wanted. All right? we, know, we know where to get you if you're wanted. And on the 16th, he spends the day uh, hanging out with one of the other members at Ford's, uh, one of the actors by the name of Lewis Carland. And he will be picked up again on April 17th. He's going to be rearrested. And this time, um, this time he's going to be brought in for good. Um, when he's arrested, the officers that come to arrest him, uh, they take some evidence uh, that, that uh, they take some of Ned's property into evidence. Um, the only thing that they could find that they attributed to Ned was a was a traveling valise and in it was a rope, 81 feet. You can see it on the screen there in line, some blank paper and a dirty shirt collar. Right. So Ned kind of lives it rough. He is going to be sent to the old Capitol prison, which you can see in the, the, the picture here. And for the first few days, he is going to be allowed to, to move freely about the yard. Um, you know, he sees other people in there that he knows. There's a bunch of other individuals that have been arrested and essentially are being held because the government has yet to interview them. They don't know whether they're conspirators, whether they're persons of interest or whether they would make good witnesses. And um, everything is going to kind of be normal for Ned until April 23rd. April 23rd, uh, Ned is going to be uh, transferred from the old Capitol prison to the Navy Yard. And he wants to know why. What in the world, uh, what in the world had Ned done to, uh, to warrant an arrest? And that was all sort of the fault of an investigation at Ford's Theater on, that happened on the 22nd. So this was that event that I was talking to you about that 156 years ago tomorrow was going to really change Ned's life. Um, investigators went to Ford's Theater and they staged kind of a reenactment of what happened. They brought in actors, they you know, measured the scenery and everything. And what they found with Booth's escape route out of the theater was that one of the corridors, right, the one that Booth runs down to get to the door, was kept, quote, remarkably clear upon the evening. And they attributed that, that back with somebody in the theater knowing what was going to happen and keeping that passage clear so Booth could run out of it. They didn't take into consideration that it was right down the hallway from the dressing rooms and the actors and actresses frequently used it. They needed somebody from Ford's that they could sort of uh, they could sort of point to and say, see, he helped Booth. They had three potential people. They had Spangler, Jacob Rittersbaugh, and James Gifford. And ultimately, it was Spangler who was going to be the one that was picked up and sent off to be one of the conspirators. They came to Ned in the prison yard. Oops, sorry. Uh, they came to Ned in the prison yard, and they told him, come, Spangler, I have some jewelry for you. And they put on some handcuffs. At first, they were regular handcuffs. Later on, they will be changed out for the lily irons that you can see Ned wearing in the picture uh, up, on the, up on the screen. He is going to be taken to the Navy Yard. Um, the, and he will be rowed out to the middle of the stream where uh, two monitors have been anchored. One of them, uh, the USS Saugus, is where he is going to go through intake. Uh, and then they will move him over to the Montauk, where they are holding most of the prisoners. Uh, and Ned reports that they take him down under the uh, under deck, uh, and they throw him into quote a dirty room between two water closets and onto a bed of filthy life preservers and blankets with two soldiers guarding the door. He is going to spend three days laying in there, practically without any uh, without any interaction to the outside world, under deck in this monitor and he noted that after three days they opened the door and a man walked in and said spangler i have something that must be told but you must not be afraid we have orders from the secretary of war who must be obeyed to put a bag on your head that bag is the notorious hoods that you've probably heard about if you study the incarceration of the the um, prisoners and their trial i've got uh, i've got an image of ned's uh, initial hood right there on the screen for you to see. And you can tell they are absolutely uncomfortable. They were tied around the bottom of the neck and they had just a small hole for your nose to stick out and for your mouth. You could not see anything. They were described as torture devices. Uh, those hoods will be mandatory, uh, mandatorily worn by the conspirators from that moment until the middle of June except for when the conspirators were in the courtroom and testimony was, be take, was being taken. At any other time, they've got to wear the hoods. 
you can imagine how maddening that would be to some of these people. Now, while Ned was on board, he noted that there were some acts of sympathy from the soldiers who were there. Um, two of them noticed that he was particularly struggling with eating with his hands manacled. Uh, so one of them stood guard at the door while another fed him. However, he also experienced the opposite kind of horrors. He did notice that one day, um, the, uh, the, a, a man came in and pulled the bag so tight uh, as to quote, nearly suffocate me. Uh, and then that individual told the guard, do not let him go to sleep as we will carry him out to hang him directly. And at that point, Ned notes that he can hear chains on the deck rattling above him and he doesn't know what's gonna happen. And they grab him out of that small room, they drag him up the stairs. And when he gets on deck, they're even messing around with him a little bit, moving him around. He's, he doesn't know whether he's gonna get thrown overboard or what's gonna happen to him. What they're actually doing is they're moving him onto another steamer that is going to take him to, uh, to the place where the trial is going to be held. That day is now, it's now April 29th, 1865. And Ned and the other conspirators that have been arrested at this point are going to be moved to the old Washington Arsenal Penitentiary on Greenleaf Point. For those of you that are local or have been in Washington, it's directly across the street from Audi Field, uh, one block or two blocks away from Nats Stadium, Nats Park. Um, Ned reported that the steamer is going to arrive at about 1030 in the evening, and he is going to be taken out of the boat, hood still on, walked up the wharf, walked into the prison, and he noted that he was, uh, he was walking with heavy irons on the entire time. He said that he was, quote, then suddenly stopped and made to ascend three or four flights of stairs. And as he stood at the top waiting, someone struck him a severe blow on the head, which stunned and half threw me over. He was then thrown into a cell, unconscious, and he woke up the next morning to begin this hellish process that was the trial. Um, Ned was thrown into cell one, uh, cell number 190. Um, and if you've done any studying on, on what happens to the prisoners while they're in the trial, they are given a very meager existence. They are completely isolated, wearing the hoods, you know, standard, we're gonna keep you alive meals. It was a hellish experience. And then the trial begins. Uh, the trial, the, the conspirators are first brought into the courtroom on May 9th. They are still hooded. The hoods are not taken off. Um, they are arraigned. On May 10th, they are brought back in. Uh, and the, the trial is going to run through the end of June. Uh, they were all charged with uh, conspiring to, uh, with John Wilkes Booth to kill the president of the United States and with aiding and abetting the assassin. Um, Ned was asked how he, how he wanted to plead. His answer was the same as everybody else, not guilty. Um, but at this point, Ned still does not have legal representation. And the trial will begin while Ned has no lawyer. Now, luckily, Ned has made a friend. And that friend was John Ford. John Ford is incredibly concerned about his employee and the treatment he's going to get. And he is actually going to approach Dr. Mudd's lawyer. Thomas Ewing Jr., who not only is representing Dr. Mudd, but is also representing Samuel Arnold, one of the other conspirators. And on May 15th, he is going to, uh, he is going to hire Thomas Ewing to represent Ned. Now, this is very fortunate for Ned because Thomas Ewing was good. He was absolutely the best defense attorney uh, in the trial. And Ford will ultimately shell out about $1,300 for his services. Uh, uh, for his services throughout the trial. It's crazy to think that on the day that Ned's attorney was hired, before they could really ever talk about anything, get a statement from Ned, four witnesses from the prosecution were called against Ned that Ewing had to go up and just kind of, you know, do his best to bat them away, bat the, bat the questions away. Um, in all, 17 witnesses are going to be called for uh, against Ned and 22 in his favor. Most of them are his associates from Ford's Theater, many of them trying to cover for themselves. However, he does have one key witness that will really make his case, Jacob Rittersbach, the young man who was standing next to him uh, when, when um, Lincoln was shot, is going to uh, testify on May 19th. And on May 19th in the testimony, Rittersbaugh does not mention anything about Ned slapping him or Ned telling him to hush his mouth. He then is dismissed, and apparently when he got back to the prison, uh, Lafayette C. Baker, who was in charge of these interrogations, was not really happy with him. And John Ford claimed to have witnessed 
uh, witness an exchange between uh, Rittersbaugh and Baker, where Baker threatened Rittersbaugh to go back and testify again, saying, by God, if you don't testify to what you said to me before, I'll put you among the rest, meaning the prisoners. He's going to make him a conspirator. You said to me that Spangler, when you said it's Booth, said don't say which way he went. And then this bullying ultimately intimidated him to go back on May 30th, take the stand again, and deliver that testimony. Ritter's boss said, you know, I didn't really tell anybody. I told Gifford while we were in prison. But yeah, this is what happened. And then he is going to be dismissed, and he is going to leave. He is going to be gone. Gifford calls him out on it on the stand. They ask Gifford, did Rittersbaugh tell you about Ned smacking him and saying, uh, and saying that, uh, that, that he shouldn't tell anybody which way Booth went? And Gifford said, absolutely not. He came to me actually and said that he wanted to go back and testify. He had remembered a few other things. And Gifford told him, well, you better go back and tell him the truth. We all see how that may have worked out. Needless to say, the trial is going to uh, continue. Uh, Ned's health is going to deteriorate. It was noted that his mental faculties started to drift. Um, and because of that, the uh, commandant of the prison, General Hartraff, is going to uh, actually ask for permission uh, to allow the prisoners to have the hoods removed, to go out into the prison yard for an hour a day to get fresh air, and to be supplied with, uh, with reading material. So in a way, Ned's deterioration actually helped everybody else that had been incarcerated have a little bit of an easier go. But that was only for about a week because the trial was uh, winding down at that point. And uh, the, the, the closing arguments were set to be given. Uh, and soon the commission was going to have to make a ruling. And what is found is that there's a, that one of the commissioners, a guy by the name of Lou Wallace. Um, Lou Wallace was a famous general in the Western theater of the war. Um, fought at Shiloh, fought at various other places, ultimately goes on to write Ben-Hur, um, for those of you who are literary fans out there. He is going to write his wife on the 26th of June, and he will say that, quote, I have passed a few words with my associate members and think we can agree in a couple of hours at the farthest. Three, if not four of the eight, will be acquitted. That is, if we voted today. Unfortunately for Ned, they did not vote that day. They voted on the 29th, and when that vote was taken, all of the conspirators were found guilty in some way, shape, or form. Seven of the eight were found guilty on both of the charges. One of them, Ned Spangler, was only found guilty on the aiding and abetting charge, and for it, he was sentenced to six years hard labor. Now, I put this image up on the screen here. This image was painted by Lou Wallace based off of sketches that he did of all of the conspirators, save Mary Surratt. You can see John Booth there with Dr. Mudd right next to him. But if you notice all the way over in the corner, you know, the farthest away from everybody else by themselves, you'll see a man sitting by himself. That's Ned Spangler. And I can't help but think that Lou Wallace did that because Ned had to have been one of the three that he could see getting off without any charges. So I don't know if this was Lou kind of tipping his cap to Ned or, or what, but you can definitely tell where he's leaning with Ned's placement in that image there. Um, on July 5th, the President of the United States signs off on the commission's findings and sentences Ned and three other conspirators to hard labor at the state penitentiary in Albany, New York. Two days after that, four of the conspirators, Mary Surratt, Louis Powell, David Harold, and George Atzerott, are executed for their role in the assassination. Um, and very shortly thereafter, the next day, the four remaining were allowed to go out into the prison yard. The scaffold still stood where it was at. The fresh dugs, uh, the fresh graves were covered with fresh dirt just to the right of where the scaffold was in this image. And they allowed the four remaining prisoners to go out for their hour of, of, of yard time. Um, uh, one, one witness recalled that Ned looked at it and shuddered, but he did note that the builders had done a good job and he was really glad that he didn't have to test out their work. And then later, Ned sends out one of the oddest requests I've ever heard, to, uh, to John Ford. He wanted Ford to give him his Bible. Okay, I can see that one. But also try to send his small dog, perhaps the small dog that was with him at the Gourlay house after the assassination, to the prison. Neither of those make it to Ned, seem, uh, needless to say. What will happen is that Ned and the four or the three other conspirators 
will be taken out of the prison about two weeks later on the 17th of July. They will be loaded once again onto steamships, presumably for their trip to the state penitentiary in Albany, New York. However, they're never going to make it to that destination because word had leaked out that their lawyer, Thomas Ewing, planned on filing a writ of habeas corpus in New York as soon as they hit uh, dry land so that he could gain custody or the judge could gain custody of his clients and they could be retried in a civilian court. In the middle of the night, President Johnson decided that that wasn't going to happen. And he changed the sentence to, uh, to Fort Jefferson, Dry Tortugas Island, Florida, where it would be very, very difficult for these men to go out and get, uh, to get a lawyer to be able to file for that writ of habeas corpus. Essentially, he's taken that ability away from them. Uh, they do not tell any of the uh, prisoners that that's where they are going. It's only when the men pass by Fortress Monroe and realize that they are not headed north, but south, that they realize they're heading to Fort Jefferson. Um, some of the witnesses that were, uh, some of the soldiers and witnesses that were along with them uh, noted that Ned was, was the one that kind of held it together the best. Um, all of the other, others had moments kind of melancholy and breakdown, uh, but Ned's spirits were much higher than everybody else's. They noted him playing backgammon with Dr. Mudd. They, call it, they said he was more cheerful. They said he talked considerably during the, during the trip, but he never really allowed himself to get too low. Now, maybe that's all of that tragedy that he had gone through uh, in his past life. I don't know, but he was able to deal with it much better than the other conspirators. And he even took some time to write back to his, uh, to his friend, Peter Toptoval, the bar owner right next to Ford's Theater. And that's where the words on this, uh, on this slide come from. Um, he ended that letter with, by saying goodbye. Sometimes think of me and my companions, though they are unknown to you personally. Now, I don't know about you, but, but that's pretty powerful. You don't know these people, but think about them from time to time. Think about me whenever y'all are sitting back having a drink like good old times. Don't forget Ned. Don't forget us while we're down here. To me, it's almost like um, on Cheers. You know, if, if Norm Peterson had been arrested and sent away for, for, uh, for prison time, that would be the kind of thing that Norm would want them to do at the bar. And as you can imagine, life at Fort Jefferson was hell. It's hot. There's no fresh water. It's out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. And ironically, this is where Ned had actually started to shine. If you think about the other conspirators that go down there, you have that genteel country doctor that I talked about earlier, Dr. Mudd. You have Samuel Arnold and Michael O'Loughlin, two guys that have desk jobs. And then you've got this rough and tumble carpenter guy who's used to living a life of meager existence. And all of a sudden, the social pecking order completely flops around and Ned becomes kind of the shining star of their prison experience. Um, the, the, uh, Dr. Mudd and the others complained about how their cell constantly flooded, how there was water that laid in it. It was nasty. It was disgusting. Ned set about to fix it. He dug them a little ditch so the water could, uh, could drain out. He even rigged up some hammocks for them so that they could sleep up off of the floor. A um, couple, uh, couple of other quotes here about him. Um, they noted, this is from Samuel Arnold, one of the other conspirators. He said that Spangler's trade was a godsend at this time and proved so much, uh, and, and more so on, uh, on more than one occasion. Um, they also noted that Ned would, uh, Ned became very friendly with the guards and the officers by making them things in the prison wood shop that he could sell to them. And then he was more than happy to, to, to use that money to, to help sort of fill out the diets of the other prisoners. Um, uh, Ned, uh, Ned, or sorry, Dr. Mudd remembered that Spangler made money by trafficking off of the officers, um, and we are mainly indebted to him for having something extra to, uh, to eat besides the crude, unwholesome, and sometimes condemned government ration that was issued to us. Um, Ned, always the industrious one, wrote to John Ford uh, to try to start an appeal, to try to start a petition to, uh, to gain his freedom. And in the letter he wrote home, despite going through all of the evidence that was wrongfully placed against him at the trial, Ned added, but Ned ended by saying, there are some small fish in the breakwater that we can catch from our cell window. Please send me some small fish hooks. So always the industrious Ned, the outdoorsman looking for a way to make life more normal. There was Ned trying to get himself some fishing hooks from John T. Ford. Um, 
And in another instance, while on the island, in true Ned fashion, um, he was having a conversation with the wife of the assistant, uh, the assistant uh, surgeon at the post. Uh, and she struck up a conversation with him about, you know, what he was convicted for. Here is how Ned responded. They made a mistake in sending me down here. I had nothing to do with Booth or the assassination of the president, but I suppose I have done enough in my life to deserve this, so I will make the best of it. Okay? You don't hear that from Dr. Mudd. Dr. Mudd sent well over 100 letters home, and they're complaining the whole time about why they aren't getting him off of that island faster. Okay? That was Ned's attitude. I probably have done something to earn this. I'll make the best of it. One of the other uh, most notable events that occurs while the four are off in Fort Jefferson is the yellow fever epidemic that will ultimately earn Dr. Mudd his pardon. Um, Dr. Mudd is always the one that gets featured because of his efforts to try to help save the, the garrison. Um, however, Ned plays a key role in this as well and never really gets any, uh, any credit. Um, Dr. Mudd noted that um, that one evening, as he was coming back um, from working from hours at trying to help sick patients, he walked into the mess hall and sat down with the other conspirators. Um, it completely exhausted and worn out and depressed. And uh, he said that uh, the way that Ned handled that was by helping us get a hearty laugh that was frequently indulged at the expense of our ready wit, Edward Spangler. So there is that wrong name again. Um, and he also is going to he's also going to be present when one of the um, when one of the conspirators falls ill. Michael O'Loughlin is going to be um, one of the early patients of Dr. Mudd. Um, and at first, it seems like O'Loughlin is going to uh, is going to make it. And then he takes a sudden turn for the worse. And he's going to pass away very, very suddenly. Um, this is an account of that, the last moments of Michael O'Loughlin's life. He looked up at Dr. Mudd and said, doctor, doctor, you must tell my mother all. He then called Spangler who was present and extending his hand, he said, goodbye, Ned. These were the last words of consciousness. The last words this man ever spoke, he wanted to say goodbye to Ned Spangler. That should tell you something. That should tell you something there. Um, Dr. Mudd is also gonna become ill. And when that happens, Ned starts to uh, really guard over and protect Dr. Mudd. Uh, as he is fighting the illness, Ned would make sure that nobody would come into the cell to bug the doctor while he was sleeping. And, he, uh, and Dr. Mudd said that he constantly was on guard and protected him and gave him the ability to rest and ultimately recover. And then luckily, in 1869, right at the tail end of Andrew Johnson's presidency, he is going to start handing out pardons to the, uh, to the remaining conspirators. Ned's pardon is going to come through on March 1st, 1869. We're talking about as last minute as you can get uh, with, with, uh, with pardons as far as his presidency goes. Um, and we could spend a whole nother session talking about the fight for the pardon for all of the conspirators. But what I want you to take away from this is that the, the person who really does the most to secure Ned Spangler's release from prison is John Ford. John Ford never gave up on Ned. He even made a statement to somebody one time that he didn't care if it cost him $5,000, he was going to get Ned pardoned. And he led the petitioning effort and the pardoning effort and ultimately was successful in getting enough influential people from Baltimore to write a petition to the president and secure that, uh, secure that, that pardon for Ned. So then what? Ned's going to be released from prison. He's going to arrive back in Baltimore on April 6th, 1869, and he is going to go find his friend James Gifford, who is going to pick him right back up and go right back into Ford's, uh, Ford's uh, theatrical performing centers. Uh, he is going to help with the renovations to Ford's Opera House, and by the time he gets to 1863, or sorry, 1873, he is going to leave Baltimore and he's going to move south to the residence on the screen behind you. He's going to move in to the home of his prison friend, Dr. Samuel A. Mudd. Um, the funny little story with Ned's arrival at St. Catherine, the house that you see behind you there or up on the screen, he greeted Mrs. Mudd by saying, Mrs. Mudd, I came down last night and I asked someone to tell me the way here. I followed the road, but when I arrived, I was afraid of your dogs. And so I roosted in a tree. He spent that night in a tree. 
And very quickly, Ned is going to be welcomed into the family. Um, Nettie Mudd, who was the youngest of the Mudd children, remembered him from her youth. And she said that he occupied himself chiefly in helping our old gardener, Mr. Best, and doing small jobs of carpentry work in the neighborhood. Um, here's where I'm gonna brag a little bit about the museum. We like to boast that we have the largest collection of Ned Spangler artifacts anywhere in the world. And I think we're right because outside of Ford's having the rope, I don't know of many other direct Ned Spangler artifacts that are out there, yet we have several of them from his carpentry work. Uh, you can see there a chest of drawers that Ned made for the family that's proudly on display in the children's room. Uh, that weird looking square there with E Spangler on it is actually the end of one of Ned's wood planes that we still have and is in the upstairs display case. And one of my favorite artifacts actually deals with Ned and tells us a little bit more about his personality. To go back to Nettie, she said his greatest pleasure seemed to be found in extending kindness to others, and particularly children of whom he was very fond. The two doll chairs that you can see there were, were made by Ned for the younger mud children, and uh, they were proudly displayed every Christmas under the tree with some of the girls' dolls in them. And last Christmas, we actually recreated the, uh, the tradition by putting those chairs out with some dolls in them under our Christmas tree. And Nettie concluded talking about Ned by saying that he had come to stay, and that was a very truthful statement. Shortly after his, um, his arrival on the farm, he and Dr. Mudd actually worked on an agreement where Dr. Mudd was giving him five acres of land so that he could go ahead and build a cabin and stay on the property forever. Ned was finally going to get his own space. But suddenly and tragically, which like I said, was a theme of Ned's throughout the entire story, he passes away in February of 1875. Um, Nettie said at about 18 months after he came, he contracted a severe illness, the result of having been caught in a heavy rain, which thoroughly saturated his clothing. His sickness resulted in his death, rheumatism of the heart being the immediate cause. And immediately the process of trying to find a place to bury Ned um, started. Um, it's interesting to note that in the uh, records of the archdiocese in Baltimore, um, there, is a, there is a conversion paper up there, a certificate of conversion for Ned Spangler. The date of Ned's conversion to Catholicism was his death date. So he, he either came into the Catholic faith in the last hours of his life, or the Muds managed to get him converted over after death. And because of that, he was buried about two miles north of the Dr. Samuel A. Mud House in the old St. Peter's Church Seminary, or Cemetery. He was 49 when he passed away, just a 49-year-old man. And if you take a look on the screen here, you can see that word quickly started to spread far and wide. And that newspaper article was actually taken from a, a, a York newspaper. And one of the striking things to me is that after all of this, the infamy of being caught up in the Lincoln assassination, they still accept him as their own. The death of a Yorker. That's how they chose to remember Ned Spangler. The death of a Yorker. Um, for a while, Ned did not have a headstone. The headstone that you see up at the top of the screen was dedicated um, uh, and, and placed over his grave on August 10th, uh, 1986, on what would have been his 161st birthday by the Surratt and Dr. Samuel Mudd Societies. So you can go and visit Ned's grave today. If you come and visit us at the house, we can give you directions on how to get there. Um, and Nettie referred to him in, in her closing writing about his death as a quiet, genial man greatly respected by the members of our family and the people of the neighborhood. Think back to the beginning of our talk. Think back to all of those negative things his contemporaries had to say. And now take a look at how Nettie Mudd chose to remember him. All right, so this will be our last slide here and then we'll get to our, our, our Q&A. How should we remember Ned Spangler? Who was this guy? Well, I hope that you picked up a few things about him as we went through here. He was a family man. He was selfless. He was an animal lover, an outdoorsman. He was a survivor. He was tough. He was a hard worker. And probably most important to Ned, he was a loyal friend. 
And I think the, the fitting way to end our talk here tonight is by going to one of those friends, Dr. Mudd, and using his words to describe Ned one final time. Here's what Dr. Mudd had to say of his friend. He was not generally select in his epitaphs towards those whom he disliked, right? I think we've learned that, typical Ned. Yet if he saw them in suffering, it excited the liveliest sympathy and he would do anything that laid in his power for, the re for their relief. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Ned Spangler. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Bob, uh, for all that detail and uh, <laughs> storytelling. You're quite welcome. Um, I think you have a few questions you got from Kathy before tonight's presentation. I didn't know right. if you'd like to start with those. Absolutely, we'll start with those. So she asked about the Dr. Samuel Mudd House and where it was located. So I'll take a little bit of time to tell everybody if they've not had a chance to come visit us. Uh, the Dr. Samuel A. Mudd House Museum is, you were correct earlier, it's in Waldorf, Maryland, um, which is about 25 to 30 miles south of Washington, D.C. So if you're from out of the area, you do have a lot that you can come in and see and do. You can certainly start in Washington and kind of follow Booth's escape route all the way down to the museum. Um, the museum really is kind of a hidden gem. There are a ton of artifacts that belong directly to Dr. and Mrs. Mudd, including the couch where the examination of Booth took place, um, right there in the parlor where it happened, um, as well as those Ned Spangler artifacts that we, uh, that we discussed. We are planning on reopening and we haven't really gone public with it just yet, but we're, we're about to probably this weekend. Uh, we are planning to reopen on May 1st. And then our, the, our days of operation are Saturday, Sunday, and Wednesday. So people can check our website, uh, that's drmud.org, for, uh, for more information. Um, and then she asked a couple of questions regarding the Mud family. One of them was about Roger Mud. So was Roger Mud related to Dr. Mud? Um, those of you who pay attention to the news probably know that Roger Mud just recently passed. Uh, the answer to the question is yes. Roger Mudd uh, was a descendant of the doctor. I am not sure exactly down which path he was because there are many, many, many Mudds. Um, but he was actually one of the founding, the charter members of the Dr. Samuel A. Mudd Society. Um, so yes, Roger Mudd was a, a Mudd descendant. Uh, and she asked about the family trying to clear Dr. Mudd's name. Did that happen? Uh, yes, emphatically they have tried um, for 156 years to, uh, to clear Dr. Mudd's name. And um, that, would be, that would be a whole nother hour long talk in and of itself. Um, but yes, they, try, they have tried a lot to try to clear Dr. Mudd's name. And we get into some of that on our tours as well. Uh, and those were her questions. So hopefully I was able to answer them for her. Okay, um, moving, on to, moving on to some questions. This is an early question we received. Uh, so thanks for waiting. Um, is Ned related to any of the Gettysburg Spanglers? Yes, Ned is actually, I believe, second cousins with the Gettysburg Spanglers, the ones that you hear about um, whenever you tour the battlefield. All those Spangler farms are distant relatives of Ned. Yes, absolutely. All right. Um, okay. Um, this question is actually from Scott Rosenau. Uh, was Peanut John considered a suspect and brought in for questioning because he was actually with the horse? Uh, no, Peanut John, he was brought in for questioning. He was um, certainly used in the trial, but he was never considered a suspect. He was never considered a suspect like Ned was. And actually, oh, he kind yeah. of fades into oblivion, too. We're not exactly sure whatever became of him. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, going back a little bit to what we were talking about before with um, Dr. Mudd's lineage, uh, this comment is from Beth. And she said, as a child, she grew up in Saginaw, Michigan. And she had a doctor, or I'm sorry, a Dr. Mudd was her doctor or dentist. Um, I don't know if you can answer this or not. Uh, was he a grandson of the Lincoln conspirator? If it is the Dr. Mudd that I'm thinking of 100%, and this actually ties back in with Kathy's um, 
uh, with Kathy's question about uh, kind of the family trying to clear the name. There are a lot of Dr. Mudd's, but Saginaw is key because Saginaw was the home of uh, Dr. Mudd's grandson, Dr. Richard Mudd, who was the first and foremost uh, proponent of his grandfather's innocence. And uh, he was the one that really, starting way back in the 1920s and 30s, started to push to try to clear for the name. He was the one that, that you know, took it to the Army Military Board for review, pushed into a whole bunch of different courts. Um, so I'm guessing that that was probably it. If his name was Richard Mudd, Dr. Richard Mudd, that was probably him. Um, you know, he toured the country, uh, sort of trying to fight for, for Dr. Mudd's name to be clear. All right. Um, I'm trying to give equal time here. Oh, this is the problem when I'm, when I'm looking at two different screens. Sorry about that. Uh, I saw you were still speaking and I thought we had lost your, thought we lost your audio, Bob. Uh, just going on to Facebook, we have a few questions on there. Uh, first question from Richard, did President Johnson ever state any reason for his pardons? Uh, so the pardoning is very interesting. Um, in the pardon itself, they actually list out the reasoning why they were being pardoned. Um, for Ned, it was really that, and I'm trying to remember it, it's fairly brief. Um, the, the biggest proponent was that um, he was being petitioned by many well-respecting individuals particularly in the city of Baltimore, including the mayor for his release. Um, if you look at, Dr. Mudd gets a little bit more coverage. His pardon's a lot more, you know, for whatever reason, publicized and in depth, probably because of that yellow fever. But both Arnold and Spangler are both let off because prominent people have pardoned them. I will say that, um, that in 1866, Johnson allegedly told Mrs. Mudd that she was planning on, or that he was going to pardon Dr. Mudd when he could, uh, because right at that moment, his, um, his presidency was starting to spiral and he had a lot of enemies that if he tried to pardon them would come after him and attack him. And then if you know the history of Johnson's uh, uh, presidency, it's only going to get worse from there. And so it's right at the very end when the pardonings start to happen. So it seems like Johnson had it in mind that they were gonna be pardoned anyways, but just couldn't do it because of the political game that he had to play. Um, this is a question from Barry. Are there any accounts of Ned's family visiting St. Catherine's? I have never come across any. There are some places that I still need to look. There might be one or two other areas of research what I just haven't been able to get to because of COVID, but it does not seem that they ever did. However, I will note that, that Ned's father actually outlived him by about six months. So when Ned passes away, his father is still in York. Now in 1869, his father wrote that he was too, uh, that he was too crippled to make the trip from York to Washington to try to speak to the president to get his son pardoned. So he was writing instead. Uh, so I have a feeling that at least dad would not have been able to, uh, to make the trek down to Southern Maryland. Haven't heard of, of any other family relations coming in there. All right, a uh, quick question in this. Um, his wife, Mary, could you spell her last name? Sure, it's Brashears. Um, let me make sure I'm looking at it because sometimes I even make a mistake. It's, a, it's an odd last name. I believe it's French when I, when I went in and looked about it. It is spelled B-R-A-S-H, so brash, ears, E-A-R-S, brash ears. That's her, that is her family name. All right, I'm going to move back to uh, questions on Zoom. Um, there are a few. There are a few questions here about the conspiracy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to see if I think we might hold off on those for just a little bit. Um, there's there's one here specifically. Uh, what was the principal evidence presented against Ned? Uh, just the slap and the comment? No, there. so there's, there's more to it than that. Um, the slap and the comment is kind of the damning evidence. And we looked at in the talk about how, you know, that may not have been as true as it seems. Um, 
But there were some other things as well. Uh, but Thomas Ewing does a really good job throughout the trial of dispelling all of them. Like he just breaks them apart. Um, one of the things that he, uh, one of the things that's brought up against him is the 81 foot long rope. Um, part of that was the idea that Booth had launched this harebrained scheme where they were going to, you know, kidnap President Lincoln prior to the assassination and that they were going to tie him up. And one of one iteration of that kidnapping plot actually involved tying him up in a theater and lowering into the stage with a rope. Well, now we have a guy with 81 feet of rope. What is he doing with that? Um, it comes up on testimony and several individuals say he took it from the theater so he could go out and crab. It, it, he made what they call a trut line. 81 feet long, every three feet, he's got a shorter line with a hook with crab meat, and that's how he's catching the crabs. Um, so that was how he dispelled the rope, which is on display up in Fords, by the way, if, you, if anybody wants to go and see it. Um, initially, Ned, because he was in the president's box, um, all of the kind of tampering that took place with the box was blamed on Ned. So the little mortise that was cut into the wall, uh, the little hole, uh, for that band box, or, or sorry, not the band box, the, the music stand uh, that was put in there that Booth wedged in there to, uh, to block the door so nobody could get in. Both, the, both the, the, uh, the wooden stand and the mortise were blamed on Ned. Um, upon investigation, it was found that the hinges on the lock were actually broken so that the door really wouldn't be able to lock. That was blamed on Ned as well. Um, however, Ewing did a great job of bringing in a witness who said, no, it was broken several weeks before. We accidentally locked the door and we had to kick it open and we didn't have a chance to replace the, replace the screws. So there were other bits of evidence that get put into the trial against him. His lawyers just, Ewing was just so good at shooting all of this stuff down that really there wasn't a whole lot of evidence to go on, which may account for what Ford was seeing. If in fact that was true, that, that, Ritter's bar was, was, you know, coerced into going back in and giving more damning testimony. Uh, that could have been the case. All right. Um, I think we have a question that goes back. You, you answered, uh, you sort of, well, you didn't offer your opinion on this, but you did talk about the defense of Dr. Mudd um, mm -hmm. in the last, you know, 150 years. Uh, do you take a side on his guilt or innocence? So um, personally, Bob, this is not any. This is not me speaking in any official capacity. From the research I've done with Dr. Mudd, it seems very likely to me that Dr. Mudd was um, a part of the kidnapping plot. There's a lot of kind of damning evidence that that seems to show that he was in on, you know, at least some parts of it. Um, and so, in that respect, I think I don't think that was coincidental, right? He tries to play it off as coincidence, but there's a lot. A lot that goes on that that I don't think is coincidental. I do not think that he would have ever supported the plan had it been to uh, to assassinate the president. Um, I, he, you know, even his even close confidants of him say, you know, he would have never. He he probably was involved in the kidnapping plot, but not. He would have never supported assassination. Um, and so that's kind of how I lean on things as well. Um, the the real key, I think, in the trial. Um, for the commissioners as they are deciding out what's going to happen to the uh, to the the conspirators, it seems like the four that were executed all had knowledge the day of the assassination that Lincoln was going to be executed, and they could have done something to stop it, but they didn't. And then the four that were sentenced to prison, well, sorry, three of them. So that would be Dr. Mudd, Arnold, and O'Laughlin. Uh, the the commission felt knew about some conspiracy, didn't do anything about it, but there was no way that they would have known about the, um, about the kidnap or about the assassination on the day of. And so that may have been why they ultimately got life in prison. And then obviously with Ned, you know, Lou, Lou Wallace tells us that they don't even want to send Ned anywhere. And he only gets six years for aiding and abetting after the fact. So, um, that would kind of be my my official Bob stance, but not in any other official capacity. On that topic, uh, you alluded to some political leanings sort of before the war, but how sympathetic do you think Spangler was to the Confederate cause? And would he have found a kindred spirit with John Wilkes Booth? 
So that's a really tough question. And I tried to include as much as I could about his political leanings. Um, we know that we know that the family was considered Democrat, and obviously Lincoln was not. So we don't know how the Spangler family voted um, uh, or how they felt about that. But there are there are several pieces of little, you know, just sort of anecdotal evidence in there that would lead me to believe that Ned was not a supporter of the president, but he didn't run off and join the Confederate cause as a soldier. Um, and he really, he doesn't do anything against the federal government. If you kind of, you know, look at how the story plays out, it does not appear that Ned was in any way, shape or form in on the, the kidnapping or in on the, um, the, the murder. As a matter of fact, there was a quote from uh, David Harold that I didn't put in just because I, I knew we were going to be crunched for time. Uh, but in, in his official very long interrogation, David Harold even mentioned that Booth felt remorse for uh, a carpenter back at Ford's Theater who held his horse. And he, he said something to the effect of he, he felt very badly that he was going to get in trouble for it, which, you know, if Booth really said that, that even tells me that John Booth didn't think that that Ned was going to support the Confederate cause. So I haven't come across anything other than the fact that he doesn't doesn't really seem to support the Union war effort. Right. If my research and not finding his uh, him signing up for the draft is correct, which, like I said, there's still some other places I'd like to look. Um, he never makes an attempt to join either army. He just kind of stays out of it. I guess it's, it's somewhat hard to keep getting some feedback. Um, it's somewhat hard to argue necessarily that if he didn't sign up for the draft, it meant that he opposed the union. It could just mean that like many people, he just didn't want to fight. Yes. So, and, and there's one yeah. other thing too. Let me add this in here as well. Um, this was back um, on assassination night. Um, another stagehand, a guy by the name of Henry James, uh, was looking at Spangler when Lincoln entered the theater. Here is what he had to say about Spangler's reaction. He said, I saw Spangler when the president entered the theater. When the people applauded on the president's entry, he applauded with them, both hands and feet. He clapped his hands and stamped his feet and seemed as pleased as anybody to see the president come in. So I don't think he, I, I, I would say probably the best way to put it is he does not support the war effort. He does not like the, the fighting and all of these people dying. He even allegedly made a comment about, you know, sort of earlier in the day, somebody said that while he was in the booth, he kind of cursed President Lincoln and General Grant. And when they called him on it, he said, they've gotten so many people killed. And, you know, we know that he's probably anti-draft. Um, we got his friend kind of making a snide comment about the conscripts not being in the draft, but you know that that sort of seems where it goes. It doesn't seem like he's in any way, shape, or form wishing ill will on the president. Okay, um, I th we have a few more questions here in the Q and A on Zoom, and I think at that point we're going to cut it off uh, because uh, we should. We probably it's time for us to wrap things up for tonight. Um, <laughs> Almost lost that. Uh, some this one's relatively quick. Are you planning a publication on that? Um, I have really toyed with the idea. Uh, there, there's not a whole lot out there on him, and I've done now a couple of years worth of research. So we'll say that it's it's uh, it's possible. It's possible. I think what better way to kind of remember him than than allowing others to remember it? So I think that I, I would like to do something in the future. We'll put it that way. Right. Um, closely related to something we were talking about a few minutes ago. Were any of Ned's Baltimore in-laws Confederate soldiers? Uh, not to my knowledge. Um, they're all a little bit older. Mary was the youngest. And remember, she was 10 years older than Ned. Um, she's 45 when they get married and she's the youngest. So um, I think if any of them did have Confederate leanings, there's no way that they're able to go off and, and join the Confederate cause just because they're they're that old. Um, there's not a whole lot about them out there. Um, I've done some research into them, just trying to kind of build the story a little bit bigger, um, but there's not a whole lot out there. I was even able to get a hold of um, some descendants who have done some more genealogical research, and they they just said there's you know there's not a whole bunch not a whole bunch for us to find. So if I come across anything, I will certainly I'll certainly get it out there. 
All right, one final question, and then uh, there's a comment I'd like to read. Uh, this question is from Joanne. Uh, what reason did the government give, if any, I suppose I should add, uh, for delaying the notification of the verdict to, I think this is uh, directed at the four who were not executed. Mm -hmm. So the, are we talking about like just sort of the, the, the end date of finding out on, Ju uh, on July 5th uh, that we were, if that's the case, if it's the, you know, the, the court kind of comes to an end on the 30th, why wait until the 5th? Um, there's, there are some, disagreements on what exactly is going on with Johnson at that point in time. I know he makes a big um, claim later on with Mary Surratt's, the whole idea of the, the um, clemency plea that, you know, he wasn't feeling well, he hadn't seen it. Uh, I'm not sure why there is that big of a delay um, between when they finally make their ruling and when it gets over to the White House and gets signed. You know, there's a lot of people who think there was a lot of really wrong things that happened with the trial and, and others would tell you that, you know, it's probably they're making sure that they have everything set the way that they want it before they come out and go public with things. Um, because, you know, those can those condemned find out right at the last minute, too. It, it's kind of like a last minute bombshell that, that it happened. So if that's what we're talking about, then then I don't have a really good answer for that. All right. Um, I know I said a last question. There's one more very brief question that I saw on Facebook. Um, okay. Do you know, is there, is there any property in York County uh, connected to Ned there's, that still exists? There's some. I don't think it's in the family anymore. Um, and let me see here. I know that the, the, there is a, the townhouse where he kind of grew up no longer exists. There's a modern structure on it, a modern house. Um, it was just a few doors off of the main square. I can't remember the street off the top of my, my head. It might have been Market Street. When you said it earlier, I said, hmm, that sounds familiar. Uh, and then there's the property that uh, that belonged to, to um, his great-grandfather, Baltzer Spangler, um, which is, I believe, a little bit farther outside of town. But I don't believe there's any structures or anything of that nature that are still standing that would have been around at that time period. Okay. All right. Well, uh, we've gotten loads and loads of uh, comments about uh, your excellent presentation. I just wanted to Thank read you. one here. Um, this is from June. And uh, she said, I have done some research and writing on Ned and your facts are right on. I have learned some new things about his life from you. Thanks so much. Uh, she's also visited the Mud House and the Surratt House. Awesome. Um, Tudor Hall, Fort Jefferson. She recommends them all. And she also strongly recommends you to publish a book because it's time that Ned gets his due. I, I've, I've been pushed uh, by some other friends too. So I, I, I should probably do something about it. Um, I should probably do something about it. The, the whole program started off almost accidentally. Uh, I needed to do something for one of our monthly talks that we have at the, at the Mud House when we're open. And I, I picked Ned just because I knew he lived there and I didn't know a whole lot about him. And then all of this stuff just started falling out. So I will, I will take up the challenge then, I guess. I will start trying to pull some things together and, and see what I can do uh, to get some Ned some, some justice in print. <laughs> And thank you all very much for the for the comments. I really appreciate that. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, if you don't mind, I can actually leave the society email that I, I moderate. And if there were any unanswered questions, people are free, uh, free to email me uh, through that and ask them. It's um, it's pretty easy. I don't have it up on the slide. It probably would have made it easier if I had done that. Uh, but it is. What's that? Bob, if if you if you read it to me, I can type it into the chat. Sure. It's Where's mud. It? M U D D okay. news N E W S at gmail.com. And if you just put in the, the, the title Ned Spangler question, I'll know what you're after and I'll try to get back to it as quick as I can. Okay, that's mud news M U D D n-e-w-s at gmail.com and yes. please put uh re ned spangler question in the subject line absolutely that'll work all right i will also add that on facebook all right well at this point uh just again i'd like to thank you for uh for this great presentation loads of detail 
Uh, I've learned a huge amount that I didn't know before. Um, but uh, we appreciate your time and uh, we hope to have you back maybe sometime in the future. Absolutely. I would love to. And, and thank you all very much for giving me the opportunity. I, I hope I did. I uh, hope I did our guys some justice here tonight for everyone. Yeah, I think so. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Okay. Have a great night, everyone. Uh, please stay tuned for our events, um, especially Give Local, which is happening on May 7th. And we hope to see you back on the third Wednesday night of May. Have a great night.